this Tuesday, treat it like a once in a lifetime opportunity. That way the sales are good and they could be like, oh, bring him back. Like make it a once in a lifetime opportunity this Tuesday. Hey everybody, this is Mike. Hi, and I'm Tisa Tisa. Tisa and you're watching <laughs> you're watching the Real Black Podcast. Uh, you know, before we jump into it, I have to remind everybody that merch is on sale. Uh, you can get this delicious hat. Ooh. Real black hat. We have t-shirts and it's getting chilly out. So you definitely want to get a hoodie. Yeah. Uh, go to shop.realblack.com. And Tisa, you're still making lots of music and people yeah. need to follow you at Tisa Williams Music so they can, they can stay up to date with that. But we've got a great guest today. I mean, if you love comedy, this is a very special opportunity to hang out with us. Yeah. Uh, you want to talk about today's guest? Yeah, this young brother is really funny. His name is Satoyo. His debut comedy album was released actually on August the 26th. So check that out. I checked it out on Spotify. He's he's hilarious. It's called The Foreigner. He is a Nigerian American hailing from Ohio, transplant here in Philadelphia. So he's been really honing his skills and his craft right here in some of the clubs. And Helium has given him a deal. So Helium Comedy Records. They are the ones that have produced his yeah. album. And he's going to be performing September 6th at Helium Comedy Club in Philadelphia. So right. without further ado, if you don't know him yet, you're going to know him today. He's a very funny young man. Everybody, welcome Satoyo. Hey, how y'all doing? Hey, we are good. <laughs> Congra well, first off, congratulations. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. That's it, uh, major. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm noticing now uh, that uh, for a lot of people, it was it's a big deal for me. Uh, but also, I've come to know like it's a, appears to be a big deal for a lot of other people uh, within the scene and the industry. So that was a bit shocking. But I'm I'm very grateful that it all came together. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. You're going to be headlining at Helium Club on Tuesday. Yes. September yes. the sixth. Yeah, September right. the sixth. Right here in Philadelphia. So uh -huh. please come out. Let's let's keep this Labor Day weekend going as long as we can. All That's right. Cool. Like come out with me on a Tuesday. It's only a two drink minimum. You don't have to get <laughs> sloshed. You can just have you can have your two little nice rum and cokes. Have a good time. I'll have a great show lined up. So it'll it'll be well worth it, I guarantee. Right. Now I, I haven't had the opportunity yet to see perform live, but I have listened to the album. Mm -hmm. And you've got a lot of energy. Yeah. You know, yeah, like, yeah. I'm, I am. I mean, my, I'm the son of a preacher man. So, cool. yeah. So, all I, how I first saw performance is you just go, and there is not a reason to be tired. And I've also always kind of been a, a little bundle of energy. So yeah. I didn't know how energetic I was on stage until people were like, oh, "That's a lot of energy that you're, that you're expending up there." And I was like, "Really? I feel fine. I don't see what the problem is at all." So that's right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what, what are you talking about in these days? I know the album was recorded right at the end of the pandemic, but. Uh... Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of what I've been talking about and writing about these days is just, just sort of still like the pandemic and the, the residual effects of this thing, at least how I feel, because I know a lot of us were happy to be outside again, but I think we're, we're like, we're all kind of like babies learning how to walk. We're, we're not, it, we, you know, we went from being able to run and sprint and be outside. Now we're all kind of like a little messy about being outside. And I don't have as much endurance as I used to with the act of outside. Like outside used to be where I wanted to be at all times. And then sometimes I look outside and I'm like, it look loud out there. I don't want to be out there. That's right. <laughs> it looks real loud. Yeah. Be loud all night? No, I can do laundry. I can do something else. <laughs> So it's a lot of that. Also, I'm getting older. So I feel like in a weird way, I'm just, I'm tired. I'm just like, oh man, I slept for eight hours and I'm still tired. Is this how it happens? Like, that's, so. That's, that's right. That's, you don't have any Red Bulls in your fridge? I, I got five hour energy shots. I do that. But, <laughs> even then, but even then that gets me to like baseline. I don't even feel energized. I just like, okay, cool. Like I've got enough energy to get through the day. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I hate to break it to you. That's what happens. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I, yeah, I talk. I talk to you know. I talk to folks older than me and unimpressed by what I'm saying. Just like, yeah, welcome. There's more to come. <laughs> it gets worse. <laughs> so welcome to the club. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
Now, Satoyo is a very interesting name. Yes. Um, I mean, I know on your album you talk about your your background, mm -hmm. but can you share with us? Yes, I am West African. I'm Nigerian. My family is from Nigeria, and I'm the first person in my entire family to be born in the United States of America. So that brings about a lot of expectation. Um, you know, in, in West Africa, there are a lot of, in Nigeria uh, specifically, there are a lot of tribes. I'm a part of the Akwaibum tribe. Uh, we're from the east. So I know a lot of people who know Nigerians. They generally know a lot of Igbo Nigerians. They are the dominating uh, class. They have the highest numbers, uh, especially here in the States. But I am Nigerian, but I am not Igbo. Uh, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. You go back to Nigeria. It has, it's been a while uh because you know things things got a little hectic there for a time and uh, i think when we were starting to gear up to go back because you can't just go back for like a week or two you literally have to dedicate like a month to six weeks yeah to that. so as you start to so I, I do this for a living you know i tell jokes for for i sell my hahas for money you know so i had to build up enough haha -ha money to then justify going back for a month and not really feeling that in a, in a negative way. And then COVID said, hey, everybody go inside. Don't worry about it. Everything's done. Right. So, so, so what did you do to hone your skills during COVID and being locked in during the year of 2020? That's so memorable to everybody. By, by that point, I had been doing comedy for so long. I didn't I, I understood that there was always going to be a timing issue, like in terms of being out in front of people again. But I, you know, naturally, I'm a solid enough public speaker that I would I would build that up again as need be. A lot of us did Zoom comedy, uh, this, which was a good way to make a lot of money for next to no physical like work, you know. So that was cool. Yeah. Um, but in every other respect, it was terrible. It was bad. But that was that that was all there was to do, because initially Zoom comedy was a lot of fun because you hadn't seen anybody. So to yes. see people through the screen and get to perform in front of them through the screen was awesome. And then next thing you know, you're you know, I, I the last Zoom comedy show I did of note, I worked a family reunion. And it turns out that this yeah. was like a, a family that. They're, they could document their family reunion for the past 90 years, but they believe their family reunions have been going back like 100 years. And these are black folk from the South. So I was a part of black history and everybody was old. Everybody was old, almost geriatric. And then they played uh, before they had me go up to tell jokes. They gave this beautiful, beautiful montage um, of everyone that they had lost so far due to COVID with I'll be missing you. By oh no! Oh. Like, yeah, and then they're like, "Up oh, next, we've got comedy by Satoyo," and the, <laughs> there, there are these seventy-eight-year-old women crying, crying. Wow. And then in the chat, they were like, "You're up in 15. Why? Why am I?" Up? <laughs> so that that one almost made me like that one almost broke me. I remember wow. getting to that, and I was like, "If they don't pay me, I don't think I'm gonna make a thing about it. I don't think." And they did, and I, I took the money and ran. I said that that'll be about it. So, is, is that, is that okay. oh. go ahead, Tisa? I'm no, I'm just like envisioning this as he's saying it. Did you turn okay. any of the cries into to laughter? I don't know. They were, they were all muted. That was another thing. That's the other. That was the other issue with Zoom comedy that no one really wants to address. Because Zoom, because again, you know, I, the people who mute themselves on Zoom comedy, those yeah. are the same type of people that want to go to a comedy show but sit all the way in the back. Like, <laughs> but that's not how comedy works. We actually need you. We need your laughter. So these people were on mute, and they just were not going to turn on the sound at all. So I can't, I don't know what's making them laugh. I know how the jokes function. Yeah. I know where the laughs should be happening, but to be giving off that much energy and getting nothing in return, why my spirit, my, my soul was, I was <laughs> like, this is, it's, it was so brutal. And I'm wearing, I'm wearing a t-shirt in my house and the AC is on, but I'm hot. I sweat <laughs> still like, it was, oh, <laughs> wow. mm. Now, now is that one of the worst shows that you've ever done, or on Zoom without question? On Zoom okay. without question, one of the worst shows I've ever done. It's this was right before I left uh, Columbus, Ohio. So right before I left Columbus, Ohio, I did the funniest person in Columbus competition, which at that point they did annually, and I had made it to the finals. I didn't win, 
but I had this, I, there was this showcase that I always wanted to be on before I left uh, to come out here. And it was called a uh, side. So circus comedy, uh, you know, comedy night. And I finally got booked on the show and I get there and this is in the dead of winter. I get there. Um, they didn't, the, the, the pipes had frozen. So the heat was out. There was no heat. And there were five people in the audience and everybody's bundled up, you know, wearing their coats and their gloves and their earmuffs. And the dude looks at me and he was like, you got 20 minutes in you? So I went up there for 20 minutes performing to five people. You couldn't laugh. It was too cold for laugh. You had to, you had to conserve that to breathe. You had to breathe. So I'm up here telling jokes with the mic in my hand and I'm breathing. I can see the, the air. I can just see the cold in the air and I got paid 20 bucks and I was like, okay, I'm good to leave now. I think that's, that's enough. That was one of the worst ones uh, that I've ever done. Well, it's those type of experiences that sharpen your knives. I'm sure all your tools in your bag for sure. Oh, it definitely. It makes you mentally very tough. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Now, now I was reading that you you came from Ohio and you were originally a dancer. Mm -hmm. So you did a lot of dancing for a lot of years. And yes. did a lot of dancing about that. Do I talk about? Yeah, I talk about being a dancer. Uh, but yeah, I, I danced for a long time. Hip hop breaking, so spinning on the head and all that stuff. And I I tore my knee up. Mm -hmm. uh, but like a young dancer, you can be hurt, but that doesn't mean anything. So I just danced right through it. And uh, I danced on it for like another year, you know, wow. because that's how I was making my money at the time. And mm -hmm. then one day I just couldn't walk. So I went and got an MRI and they were like, yeah, your knee's jacked up, dude, like <laughs> your knee. So I, I got, I had surgery on the knee and I still dance, but they were very clear. Like the, the level of frequency and the level of intensity of which you dance with, you probably shouldn't do that going forward. If you want to maintain your knee, they were like, you can go, you can go all out. Go for it. Knock yourself out. You can have another five years in you, but you'll have knee replacement surgery. So that's when dancing as a full time profession was that mm -hmm. was done. That was all done. All right. So yeah. what, what led you into comedy? My friends gave, you know, sometimes your friends, sometimes your friends. It's one of the with friends like you who needs enemies, you know what I'm saying? So, they had been <laughs> me. so I think it came from a good place because they had seen me just doing nothing i was just rehabbing so at the time i'm like this 23 24 year old you know young person having a, an identity crisis and like yo you know you're funny you've always been funny you've been funny for a long long time and you should just go up and do comedy they had said this to me for years but i was doing something in my head that was i was like bro i spin on my head and flip that's way cooler than telling a joke so i had no interest in doing that whatsoever but now i'm at home you know, I, I can't walk without crutches. So they were like, you should give this comedy thing a try. So I I had nothing else to do. I was like, why, sure, why not? I went to an open mic and uh, I asked them how this thing works. They told me the rules of the open mic. It was called Hal and Owls. I still remember the name of the spot. And they said, they told me how it went. So I went home and I wrote a bunch of material and then rehearsed it for two weeks, which is crazy to me because I would never do that now. Mm -hmm. And um, there was this girl I was dating at the time and she was very, I put her through so much because I, I would rehearse in front of her and she just, she yeah. was so, she was so care, like, you know, how women are like, just be caring, just want to see a win. I would never do that to a person now. <laughs> and uh, just because it's just like, I would just edit. I'm like, no, I'm gonna edit this way. And then she would just be very supportive. And then two weeks later, I went to that open mic, a bunch of my friends came and it went way too well. Like it just went way like had a Thanks. great set people were very very complimentary and then that got me thinking okay maybe i should keep on doing this so i yeah. did yeah. so you found your calling you know they always say when one door closes another opens and you did yes. you, you apparently had all the talent to do it mm -hmm. um, i always say and mike knows this i i always say it's the friends it's the people around you that can see what's in you that you can't see yourself mm -hmm. and so many people have have launched careers for that reason yes so it's a good thing that you answered the call yeah because you definitely I, are funny <laughs> well thank you thank you i honestly i had nothing else to do at that point it was almost boredom because especially i'm a person who needs oftentimes you know 
people will ask me like, what do you like most about comedy? It's easily, it's being on stage. Mm -hmm. um, I like entertaining the audience. Also at the same time, I like entertaining myself. I like doing things that I haven't done before, saying yeah. things that I haven't said before. So I really like entertaining because it entertains me to do it. So I just had nothing to do. I was like, yeah, I'm sitting at home. And they were like, hey man, you, you might as well do this thing that we, we know you can do. Yes. Um, and finally, I was bored enough to take them up on it. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Now, I know it's a, a tougher. Now, how, how did this deal with Helium Records come about? So it came about where there was no real con. I didn't really have a thought to do an album. But uh, a friend of mine and a very, very funny uh, gentleman as well, his name is Daryl Charles. Daryl had dropped an album in 2020, right before the world ended, called Black Gentrifier. And I think it, that was the best album, comedy album of that year. And Daryl said, hey, you know, I don't know what your, you know, what what your plan is, because now it's 2021 and, you know, we're getting outside a little bit. He's like, but I, I told the people at Helium Records that, you know, they should they should work with you. Would that be something that you'd be open to? And at this point, I think for a lot of us are the only people who had somewhat stable careers were comedians who were already famous. If you were just a worker, you had to readjust everything. So mm -hmm. when we started coming back outside again, we understood that what comedy looked like was no longer going to be what comedy was in the same way. So had it not been for COVID, I wouldn't have thought to do the album, but Daryl, he's like, yo, you know, if you're down for it, here's his email and you can get in contact with this gentleman and, and you guys can go from there. And uh, that's basically how it went. I reached out to them and they're like, Hey, if Daryl's vouching for you, you're good by us. Um, so now it's just about finding the time to, to pull it off because this is 2021 where the clubs are just getting back open again. So everybody's got to make money, you know? So they were 2021 was an interesting year because I was confirmed to do the album, but they they were just stacked. You know, initially it was just killer headliner after killer headliner, like every single night, because you got to recoup those losses. You know, those PP uh, P loans only go so far. That's so right. so that's how that came about. So it was about uh, October of 2021 they had reached out to me and they were like, Hey, you know, do you want to do it over the course of a week? Like record a bunch of sets and then headline on Sunday. Cause if that's what you want to do, you'll have to wait longer or you can just do it in one take. And I was like, I can totally do it in one take. I don't need to wait any longer. Like, let's just get this thing going. And then we, uh, it got settled to do on, uh, on February in February. Mm. That's what's up. You stay ready so you don't have to get ready. Exactly. Yeah. That was one of those situations where, because I'd already been headlining some smaller clubs and smaller venues before COVID happened mm -hmm. and doing hours at breweries and, and little theaters. So I was pretty set on what the, I knew my set and I understood that like I've been outperforming enough. I, I can do this. I was like, I can, you know, you give me enough 20 minute spots here and there. I'll figure the set out and I'll just write it out and then I'll rehearse it and then I'll be good to go. And, and thankfully that is what, that's what happened on February the 16th. Wow. I mean, was, was there a lot of pressure? I mean, it's like almost like, I mean, I can't even imagine what it's like, you know, you're recording your first album. I mean, can you take us back to that day? Man. So, I mean, it was a, it was a crazy few days. I was a crazy few days going into the lead up of that. Like I had, uh, you know, not to go too deep, but like, what was it? That Saturday, I I was assaulted in Center City, wow. so I so I wound up in Jefferson Hospital. So I had some abrasions to my face, and my my eye was black, and you know, bloodshot. And my mom was coming into town that Sunday for the album recording, so she had never seen me. Um, she had never seen me do comedy for like eleven years. She hadn't seen me do stand up. So I get assaulted. Thankfully, you know, I'm, uh, Jefferson takes care of me. You know, I get home. I realize I have to, like, call my mom and explain what my face is going to look like to her. Uh, so that's a very difficult conversation. Uh, then go pick her up, you know, and we're masked up and explaining to this, like, Nigerian woman what happened to her son, letting her know I am okay. Then I have to tell the club what happened so I don't show up there looking wild to them. 
So I had to tell them I'm okay. Then I had to go to the club and tell and show them, hey, I know it looks crazy. I'm mm -hmm. all right. Don't worry about it. Um, so, and then I'm taking care of my mom. I put her up in a hotel, um, you know, spending time with her. Um, and then thankfully I, I, I was near a Sephora and I, I had the bright idea. Oh my God, I can, maybe I can find something to help with my face. Yeah. So I walked into the Sephora and the dude was like, how can we help you? And I just pointed at my face. I was like, help me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, basically I learned how to put on concealer to like cover the black eyes mm -hmm. and, um, had like a, some, a bandage to cover my face. So I had like the Nelly from 2000 country grammar thing going on. So I, I all of those things had happened. So going on stage was the easiest part of that whole situation. That, that was the easy part of the whole thing. So I think, you know, a lot of people had shown up. My mom was there and I just wanted, I knew that I could have a nice time. And I think that for, uh, to the select few people who I had told, um, I was like, well, let's just have a nice time. So you guys know I'm okay type of thing. So it's, and I was hocked up on adrenaline. So I can't really tell you too much about how nervous I felt. I felt like that was the most control I had had in about like four or five days, you know what I'm saying? So, so yeah. I kind of, I kind of felt in the most control in that moment. Wow. That was a lot to go through. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's, still, it's, it's still just strange. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I, you know, I'm, I am my mother's son. So, you know, for, for her sake, she was, you know, she's Nigerian. So she's like, you're okay. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just, you know, we'll address all that later. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, talk, talk about that because one, one of the things I thought was interesting, like, I mean, Godfrey is a friend of the show. He's Nigerian yeah. and um, you know, Michael Blackson's from Philly, yeah. you know, so you, your act is a lot different than those guys. Yes. You know, I mean, now how, how do you develop your, point of view like how do you, is it just you being you like what's what was I, your upbringing like and and how how does it come out on on stage i think that uh my upbringing was i mean i i, I you know it's the title of the album is the foreigner so at growing up as a kid i just kind of stuck out you know just culturally um because you know you're still a black kid but you're not a black american in that way so you don't fully fit in with them you clearly don't fit in with the white kids um, you actually fit in most with other immigrants, you know, like other people who have like immigrant parents. Yeah. So, uh, you know, English not being my first language, uh, taking things too literally in conversation. I didn't know what slang was. So someone could say to me, that's cool. And if it's August, I'm like, well, it's actually rather humid outside. You know, I was like that kid. So, <laughs> so a lot of my observations about how I saw people and how people saw me. Also, I think that, you know, um, I do speak about her on the album, my mother and the, you know, and, and the admiration that I have for her. She was also a very pivotal person and a pivotal character in my story because I can tell you about me, but here's also why I'm like this because of this person. So that's a, and then that's a lot of how the, the act started. When I moved out here, it was more advantageous to, then there's that, like that culture shock of living on the East coast. So then it was just like sort of me on the East Coast and where I come from and how I'm not used to the things that I'm seeing and experiencing. Uh, and that gave me a foothold to figure out how to talk to people on the East Coast a bit. Uh, it was not initially a, a smooth transition. It was a very bumpy one moving out here, going to mics and showcases, like going up at two o'clock in the morning you know, consistently, sometimes performing to no one, uh, just some hosts who are tired and drunk and thinking, OK, I've, I'll make it work somehow, you know, type of thing. Yeah. So I think that when I really leaned into. When it's like I've, well, I've put everything on this, like that I've, I've created no I've created no escape plan. So um there's a hint of desperation that comes with that, I think. And in that desperation, that's where my creativity sort of popped up more and more to where I would just further talk about the fact that, okay, I'm a little off to some of you guys. Um, I, I have strong opinions about lotion. Let's dig into that. I hate, I don't like guacamole. Let's get into that. Like, you know, I love this city. Here's what happened when you guys won the Super Bowl. All these other things that I was then able to pull from 
while then also talking about my upbringing uh, as a Nigerian in, in the Midwest. Absolutely. Right. Well, who were some of your influences as far oh, as comedians? I'll say this. I didn't have any comedian. I never, I never thought I was going to do this. So I didn't think about a comedian that like inspired me, let's say. But I will say here are the comedians who I thought were just the most fun when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. Who I thought, who I didn't think, oh, I would like to do comedy like that. But I would, uh, not that, but I would always watch their set because it was going to be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, I know, you know, artistically, I'm separating the art from the person. Bill yeah. Cosby growing up. Um, Godfrey, I remember thinking Godfrey was just like the most, I thought he was great because it was just like, oh my God, he's talking about my dad, you know, type of thing. <laughs> so Godfrey was really, really cool. Michael Blackson, I thought was very uh, fun. Kevin Hart, I remember first time seeing him, I was like, this guy's really fun. He's just really fun and he makes this look enjoyable, you know? Uh, so I really dug him. Uh, Margaret Cho, actually. I thought she was great growing up. I thought she was really cool. Um, I think that's, those are, that's kind of about, oh, Louis Black. I thought his rage was awesome. I thought the fact that here's this Jewish guy who just yells at every politician. I was like, yeah, that guy. So yeah, it was, it was a pretty short list, but that was definitely the initial list. Love yeah. it. So, you know, you're a good looking guy. Well, well thank you. Now, most most black comedians are not good looking guys. Well, oh, Mike, you might get in trouble saying that. <laughs> hey, so, so sorry to them. I'm so sorry that that happened. To them. Is in the hour to be you know, do you, do you find any challenges when you first come on stage in terms of people's expectations about what, what kind of night they're going to have with you? Uh, at this stage, I don't think about it too much. I understand that the moment that I speak, people are going to have their thoughts. And to that, that's fine. I've got that all taken care of. <laughs> you know, I, I'll, I'll address, right. especially given the room and the dynamic, because as, as the room is judging me, the beauty of it all is I've got to judge them first. So yes. I get to look at everybody come in, sitting down, and I get to assess how this is going to go and all this other stuff. And I'm like, uh-huh, all right, I know exactly who you people are. So I know who you are before you know who I am. And, and you've got the mic. And I, exactly. And I was just about to say that. And I've got the mic. So I'm in the power position. So I can already judge and assess you. And, but get, but also, yeah, I can poke fun at myself. But also, like, I don't have a, I'm not one of these self-deprecating performers either. But I can do it in such a way like, hey, man, I get it. You know, I look like a guy that would go to karaoke and just sing seal songs all night. That's I get it. Like, <laughs> I get that. I, I I look like an R and B cover. This is fine. <laughs> like I get it. So let's yeah. let's get that out the way and go for. It. And then and they feel and I think especially it's very unique to Philly, New York to a lesser degree. But once you address that, once I've told you like you can't hurt me with it, I know what you think I look like. That oh, Bo already know what he looked like. It's fine. Okay. Right. Yeah. So we're we're with Satoyo, and he's got a brand new album out on Helium called The Foreigner, and he's gonna be performing this Tuesday, September 6th at Helium uh, mm -hmm. Comedy Club in Philadelphia, so. Uh, We're giving you a little bit of a taste right now. He's a yes. funny guy, but definitely everybody check him out for sure. Philly in the building, Jersey in the building. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm not any of y'all. I don't, <laughs> I can't claim you. <laughs> I'm not from the East Coast. I am actually from Columbus, Ohio. First of all, I got out and you can't make me go back. That's the first thing, okay? I moved to Philadelphia about eight years ago. Cause like the old saying goes, life is short. So move to Philadelphia and make it shorter, right? Like just do, do like Kesha says, die young. You know I love Philly. I love this place, man. Also did not have hypertension three years ago. So nothing's fair. <laughs> But being a Midwest boy is a little different, man, where I come from. You know, being solidly Midwesterner, I, I know people who have very, very different views. It's like, I know people who are not vaccinated. Yeah, and they're not going to do it, okay? You can't bully them with your liberal sensibilities, you know? And again, we're going through a hard time. I dig that. I just don't like some of the excuses that I hear from some of my friends back home who refuse to get vaccinated. I was talking to my homie. He lives in Indianapolis. We were talking on the phone. He came in hot out of nowhere on the phone. He was like, you know, I don't trust these vaccines, brother. 
My third eye is open. I don't know what they put in that. And I don't put shit into my body when I don't know what's in it. And I was like, Mark, you drink four locos. What's your future like? What do you what do you see yourself doing in in addition to your stand up? Mm -hmm. As far well, as been, film been or media or so the camera's definitely calling. So I've been doing some auditions for like commercial work. Um, I've also been doing some voice acting work. So that's kind of like, that's a very lucrative uh, lane to be in. And I've been complimented on my voice and, you know, how it can sort of carry. So doing more of the, the voice acting on top of that, um, I think I just need to up the, the theater uh, portion of that so they're just I, there definitely needs to be just more acting that's yeah. happening oh, so yeah, yeah. on top now, of do you do any impressions and if you do give me your best one i do not do any impressions that's the impressions. that's another thing uh that's another thing like people i'm one of the few nigerians whom i a couple of times have done a good Im impersonation of like my mother and my father but honestly that just it that lane was already done. Like Godfrey had already done it. Like he, to me, he did, he did it. He mastered it. So to me, if I was going to do that, it would just be a, a knockoff pastiche of that, which I just couldn't, I couldn't abide by personally. So it's, it's just better for me to describe, to make my mom like a caricature, you yeah. know, of her and without the accent because she's already a very silly person. So, uh, but no, I've never, I've never really had accents in me. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So you do speak the native language. Yeah, I speak I speak the Aquaibum dialect. That's the only one I speak though. So wow. there there are 500 different dialects in total. Mm -hmm. uh, so but if an Igbo person starts speaking to me in their dialect, I don't know anything that they're saying. We yeah. we can't communicate. That's why I mean we were colonialized. So that's why every Nigerian that you meet speaks English. We may have thick accents, but yeah. we all speak English. Yes. Right. Now I mean, I'm just curious in terms of perception growing up, like I, I didn't have this experience as the foreigner. Um, you've got you've got to assimilate, you've got to maintain your own cultural identity, but then also be aware of the cues that come with being African American. I mean, what is what is that like? Um as a it kid? was it was very interesting because I growing up, you sit there and you think based on your skin tone that you are pretty much, you know, you're all in this together type of thing. And then, you know, I, I thankfully I had, I had one, he wasn't a friend, but he, you know, he was like, you know, all black people are related, you know, except for Satoyo. And he did, he meant that as like a dig on me. He meant that as a cut on me. Uh, but I remember I was like 13 and I remember thinking to myself, okay, that maybe is coming from a place of, of hurt or pain, or maybe it's not liking me. That's totally fine. But then I really wanted to be like, okay, well, there's kind of something to that because my introduction as a, as a black human being is, is different than his. Um, we were both set upon, but the dynamics of this are different. So for me, it helped me. Uh, that's when I, I think I really became like a history buff, especially with American history. That made me look more into things like the slave trade, like, um, you know, the enslavement of, of you know, African folk to then, you know, uh, three fifths a person, all these other things. I'm like, yeah, those are other generational traumas that are, that I do not actually have. I have these generational traumas, but I have, but also I have these victories. Like, yes, we were colonialized and then we beat them. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like we beat them. I, I, I can't, you know, as my father would say, like, yeah, we were never, we never bent. We didn't do that, you know? So it was one of those things to where I had a different view, like socially, I was socialized by my mother and by my father when he was around to not view myself through the lens of white people. It just wasn't, it just wasn't how I was to operate. And anytime they would see me operating in that way, they would almost like smack it down, like, don't do that. So um, I had to acknowledge that culturally, I am a, I am a Nigerian American who is here. I am the first. Um, but my friends have generations in this, like they have generations in this and experiences in this. And it's important that I understand those differences so that I don't have this attitude 
that I think that sometimes a lot of West Africans will have to be like, nah, they're lazy, they're this, that, and the third. That is the furthest thing from the truth, actually. They're actually continuing to keep this whole deal going, even though it's only 12% of the population. So um, I, I had to I had to come to grips with that, understanding that society at large may very well see us similar to a degree, mm-hmm. right? But but you see me differently. Um, and that's understandable. And I do understand that. So was was there anything culturally in American culture that became a touchstone for you to identify with, you know, like through music or television or pop culture? As a child, it was cartoons. Okay. That was something that that all that we could always like we all watch like Tiny Toon Adventures, Ninja Turtles or what that was kind of like the unifying thing. Also was good. It was teaching me slang. So that was very helpful. So I could better communicate with my friends because I I I wasn't I was I didn't I didn't sound fun. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I I when you you know you go outside you can speak slang and whatever. When you came back to that apartment, you were uh, in the Commonwealth of of, of Patakwat, Nigeria, and you are in. So the, we didn't do this slang. It was very formal. It was it was the Queen's English, and you were to speak in that way. So getting to watch cartoons, getting to do that with my friends, gave me greater understanding of them. Then it was music. Then and it the, was then it was rap and stuff like and that. The break dancing. Uh-huh. The break dancing gave you some co- some social acceptance. Break, yeah, well, yeah, break dancing put me in front of a different group of friends who many of them were immigrants themselves, um, or you know, their parents or grandparents were, you know, here. Uh, so they'd only had like two, three generations in. Um, a lot of uh Puerto Ricans, like it just put me into a a different a different friend group, a different peer group. Um that realistically still had its issues, of course, but it was like more merit based. It's like, nah, be skillful, be cool and learn about this culture. So it doesn't matter if you're from here, or if you're from there, if you're a part of hip hop culture, just learn this culture. So that was a big unifying thing for me to have as a teenager. It was very helpful. For sure. With all the racism here in America, what is it like in Nigeria as far as any battles that cultures and subcultures may go through that uh, we here in America, especially as black Americans, because we were colonized as well. And, Mm. you know, the whole history of slavery and all. But what is it that Nigerians battle? Uh, I think all of them or the challenges that they may face. Uh, in short, capitalism, (laughs) like, you know, you, you, you are, uh, set upon by the British. And what we just wound up doing is we just kind of went and did what they did. Like when when they left, we had a civil war. Um, we wanted there were there's a certain group of us that wanted to break off from the idea of Nigeria and create a system that was that was different. And France and America were like, there is no way we are letting you take that oil. <laughs> so we are going to fund Nigeria and you will fall back into the fold. So I think a, a big problem that Nigeria has, of course, is there is a wealth disparity, like tremendous wealth disparity, um, a very brutal caste system, much like here. Um, it is not. So, for instance, I go back there. It's like that's the closest I'll ever get treated. I, I, I'm the most human when I'm back there. Also, I could be a victim back there based on the, the per, perception that I have money and mm. that I have means. So uh, there is that. Um as as tough as we are on women here, uh, tougher there. Um, let's say the idea of the LGBTQIA community more more brutal over there. Um, we have had attempted coups so like this coup that was attempted on January the sixth. I mean, my family was like, "Yeah, that's that's about right. You guys are finally becoming a country." Like you know, like. <laughs> That's you're not that's what happens, you know, that type of thing. So I think that a lot of the horrors and the corruption is just much more. uh, Let me let me amend that. I would have said if you had asked me this seven years ago, the corruption is just much more in your face. Now, I don't know. I, I think I think it's pretty even. I think, you know, America, you know, thanks to Trump has done a good job of showing the actual colors that they're you know, there's no country more corrupt than this one. Um, But over there. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit more flashy 
if I if I can say. Uh, and then we'll have issues like there was a time where they were kidnapping young girls, you know, like mm-hmm. pirates were literally kidnapping girls and we just yeah. couldn't, you know, we just couldn't find them. So those are huge, huge issues that, uh, you know, my country still struggles with. I Do you believe. get political in your act or? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I think I think that by default, my act is political, right? I don't have a say in the matter. Uh, every statement that I make is a political act. Um, it is a political statement, even if I don't want it to be one, right? Like, um, it, so for instance, I have a joke about Ice T. That's just supposed to be about the absurdity of his life. But realistically, it's like, no, he was just Jay Z before Jay Z. You know, it just talks about you know coming, yeah. you know, how you went from crooked, crooked to straight. So that's a political statement in and of itself. I have a, you know, a joke that literally I call white on white crime. That's a political statement. Um, yes. you know, like, uh, but even when I talk about my mother, I'm, I'm talking about my mom in such a way that's a political statement. Hmm. So I, and I've, I've tried to tell this to other comics. I, I wouldn't, you can't worry too much about that. Like when a woman goes on stage to do comedy, regardless of what she says, it's a political statement. She's a woman doing comedy. There's going to be a certain group of people in that audience, especially if there are men there who think she shouldn't be up there. Or I am not to take her funny because women ain't funny. So now, you know, whether you like it or not, right, your existence is political. Mm. Uh, and they can sit there and they'll say, don't politicize things. It ain't us that's doing it. <laughs> like, it's, 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 you know, it's them, it's the masses. So so it's like, no, nah, you can't gaslight me. I'm making a political statement simply by being here. I wish it wasn't that way, but um, society won't stand for it. Yeah, well, that depends on the kind of room that you're playing to, though, too. You know, I mean, I, I think it's, it's um, you know, from the time I started observing stand-up comedians, like there was a time when you had to perform to everybody because the goal was to be on yes. The Tonight Show. Yes. Right? So you had to learn how to work a room where where you made everybody in the room laugh Mm -hmm. where where now it just seems to me like it's more fragmented and and you can play certain venues and just play to your audience the kind of people that are like you and still be successful i think that is very much the case for uh you know and i don't even mean this in a disparaging way it just sort of is what it is like for a lot of white dudes you know what i'm saying like there are a few white dudes who don't care and they'll go anywhere like they'll go anywhere you know Mm -hmm. um or, or they're either like young and they'll go anywhere because they just, they just, they are just good at it. Or older comics who have been in the game 20, 30 plus years and they're like, yeah, I had to perform every, I used to, you know, I, I did all, I did the original Laugh House. I had to do all that stuff, you know? Right. Um, so I think that, that it's that way. I think that for people like Daryl Charles, people like myself, people like Latisse, who's a comedy legend. They, you still got to perform in front of everybody. You got to go in front of everyone because your your base is going to be very, very – your fan base that eventually finds you or you eventually finds them is going to be – it's going to it's gonna be a lot of different looking people. You know what I'm saying? It's just going to be a lot of different looking people, whereas some of my contemporaries who are white, they, they got one fan group of fan base. But that mm. fan base is rabid, and that fan base will pay money. That fan what? base will, will pay that Patreon, and they they will do it. I think that um, I I, I got to do more stuff, you know, to sort of get that, mm. you know, oh, or or just like try to go into that lane and be like that. But that's just not that's not what my comedy is or perspective is. Yeah, you have to always stay true to yourself. That's number one. But right now, at this at this point in your career, who would you say is your audience? Do you draw women? Do you draw a, a, a certain age demographic, or where where you think you stand right now? Uh, I think I draw a lot of immigrants, uh, some women, a lot of immigrant women, like a lot of like like Russian women, mm. um, like I you know um, a lot of Russian men too, you know, like Eastern, like the Northeast, like kind of. You know, they 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 showed a lot of love, a uh, mm-hmm. lot of a lot of black folk um, and, you know, a lot of a good amount of, of white people, too. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm going based off of the album recording and just what the room looked like, which is like, I was, oh, this is perfect. It's like this is what I would want. I want immigrant folk here. I want, you know, black people here. I want I want everyone here That's because, right. that we can so that literally 
<laughs> one, time. yes, the best. And also, two, yes, okay, I can appeal to all of y'all. Um, yeah. So hopefully I can just continue to do that in a very, very concentrated uh, way. Because there are some people, you know, it's very, having that fan base is very, very, it's very hard. But once you figure out exactly what it is and why it is, then then you're good to go continuously. Yeah, and I'm sure it helps to shape your material too, like the things you want to talk about. And is there ever a point where you just kind of freestyle it? Oh yeah, a lot of times. Like time. so, uh, like I'll go up and play a lot, especially if I'm at like a mic or whatever, I'll go up and play um, because I gotta, because I, oftentimes there have been, so if you listen to the album, a lot of those, some of those jokes I never wrote. They didn't need to be written. I right. just wrote them on stage, on stage and I would just do them and, and play with them that way. So if you asked me to like pull that joke up in my phone, I couldn't. It doesn't exist in, in a text format. Uh, yeah. it, exists, it exists in an audio visual format. And there are some jokes that are very meticulously written. Like mm -hmm. the, uh, the joke about, you know, uh, bartending. Vir virtually all those jokes were just written. Uh, mm -hmm. Now they happen, but I had to write them. So uh, there's that. But oftentimes, yeah, this week when I've gone up, I've played. Now the jokes I've had, that are they're written. But generally, let's say if I'm doing a five to ten minute set, a five minute set, I'll play for like three and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. Just just being funny, interacting with the room, interacting with the space and, and seeing what's there. And then I'll do that one joke that I really wanted to do. Yeah. And and hopefully I've worked the audience up to enough of a fervor that they are ready to hear this written material and they can't really tell when they're hearing the written material. I want it to all sound like this one thing. Mm -hmm. Like it's just me talking to you. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Brilliant. So five year plan, where, where do you expect to be in five years? Uh, further along than this. I mean, honestly, I, I try not to do the five year plan because I, I think I was doing the five year plan before COVID. And the five-year plan was stressful, right? Because mm -hmm. if something didn't, if if I, if I was behind a little bit, it would make me very, very anxious. Uh, so I, I didn't know how to process that. But what I can say is, is that I, you know, hey, thankfully, hopefully I'm still here. I think that's the most important thing. I've, these past few years have really taught me to like, don't assume <laughs> that you're going to be here, you know, really hope for the best that you will be. So do what I can to ensure that I am still here. And then at that point, at least if nothing else, be a national headliner, a national touring headliner weekly. Um, and then, you know, on, on a TV show of some kind. Super grateful to have you here at this stage in your career, you know, Thank you. and I know, you know when, when you get down to one name, that's, that's a big thing. I mean, I started as one name and I'll never, I'll never, Satoyo does fine enough. The, the last name, it gets excessive. And also like, that's, that's my dad's side of the family and I don't really know a lot of them. So it's kind of like, but if you ever see an ECPO, I'm related to them. I just don't know who they are. You know what I'm saying? So it's just easier to go by one name. Yeah. Well, I, I'm Mike, I'm Mike D. So mm -hmm. I, I just have the initial. And yeah. Tisa, Tisa. And Tisa, Tisa, so I should drop one of my names. <laughs> no, no, keep that. No, no, that, that's good. It's better <laughs> twice. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for hanging out with us thank you this has been fun thanks for yeah. joining us today thank y'all so much for having me man i greatly appreciate y'all